Women's flyweight, Cynthia Cavillo making her flyweight debut after six UFC fights at strawweight. She's favored over the number one ranked flyweight, Jessica I. She missed weight by a half pound. And we'll pick things up in round two. Cavillo suits the takedown, eventually gets it. This is sort of the theme here where I wanted to stand up. Cavillo was trying to get on the ground and after the first round was able to do so in, in most spots and eventually became a much bigger favorite as the fight went on. In round three, you see it again. Cavillo, takedown, end up on top. After round three, Cavillo, 87% chance to win the fight at minus 650. Now let's go to the fifth and final round. Another takedown by Cavillo, starting to see the theme here. And that would pretty much do it. You could see this was a fight where Cavillo did what she needed to do, exercised her game plan, and uh, a much deserved and well earned win. Her first UFC flyweight win. You see there, that was the, the popular wager. You know, at, earlier in the week, the two were almost in a pick 'em, and then you saw money come in on Cavillo, and she became a, a significant favorite, public or professionals, however it came down, betting very smartly there, taking Cavillo. Um, it would have paid nicely, uh, the Cavillo decision, uh, plus 225. Ryan Campbell, our guy. There he is. Uh, I mean, there's nobody better in the world when it comes to breaking this stuff down. I'll get to the fights. Let's start here. What's your overall headline for the night? Uh, you know, for the women's flyweight division, which of any UFC division is the most narrow, this is a very small pool of fighters available to tee up to the dominant champion, Valentina Shevchenko. We came out on the end of this night with two interesting players into that mix suddenly, including Cynthia Calvillo, who you mentioned, with a fairly dominant victory. All right, Calvillo looked very good. Uh, executed a game plan against a bigger fighter. Uh, we saw that, and that kind of went the way against the public uh, as the week went on, really started backing Calvillo, and that was uh, to their, their benefit. Also, we had other fights tonight in addition to the Calvillo I fight. We had uh, Marvin Vittori who beat Carl Roberson. There was some bad blood coming in here. Guys missing weight, screaming at each other in hotel lobbies, getting rescheduled, getting rescheduled again. Finally, they got it on, and it was all the Italian dream here. What'd you make of this one? Uh, Marvin Vittori, you know, he has that potential to be a potential dark horse in this division. But he's that rare fighter who almost needs drama to bring out the best in him. And he'd had a bad luck run of fights being scheduled and falling apart for various reasons. We saw him attack Roberson in the hotel, or at least try to, ahead of the last time they were supposed to fight. He rode that adrenaline and that emotion to a dominant victory. Here's the deal. We all remember him pushing current champion Israel Adesanya to the limit a couple years back in a split decision loss. You could flip a coin on who could have won that fight. You do have to ask yourself after watching Vittori rip off three straight victories, including this impressive one over Roberson, whether he could have been in that spot. The jump Israel Asanya made, Asanya made from nobody to champion was dramatic. What if Vittori had won that fight? That's what we don't know at this point. Afterwards, he was talking about getting a top 10 opponent in his future at middleweight. I think you can give him a top five one. I want to find out right now how good Marvin Vittori is for real. He's got the champion's name in his mouth. He's going to be a tough out for everyone at 185. And, and if he were a guy that were getting uh, significant plus odds, no matter who he was with, he seems like he would be a guy that'd be worth taking a flyer on if you could get him in odds pretty much against anybody because he seemed like he'd have a shot. Is that fair or do you see it differently? Yeah, he does. Look, he's a tough fighter. He's aggressive, high volume. You can see the knockout potential just by seeing his demeanor and how firmly he lands strikes. But to be able to have the kind of performance that he did tonight, showing the urgency, but showing the versatility on the ground to be able to make those quick adjustments, swoop in when the opportunity was there to set up a submission attempt, you are seeing a fighter who is evolving right in front of your eyes. Sometimes, EK... You know, when the career doesn't go the way you want it in terms of decisions falling out of your hands and fights falling apart, it can build that callus. 
that continues to build a champion on the inside. He's going to have to continue to prove himself. But like I mentioned, there is video of him out there against the current champ, and he looked great in that fight as well. In the all-nickname match of the evening, we had Touchy Feely against Air Jordan. Uh, would you make a Touchy Feely who had a slow start in this one? I, I mean, I thought he lost the first round, and this was only a three-round fight. I'm thinking, boy, he better really step up quickly and sort of did and earned a split decision. Your reaction? Uh, I thought it should have been unanimous. He looked great. Look, he's got the best nickname in the game. He may have the best tats in the game, EK, and I know that's something you're into as well. Look, Feely came out there against Jordan. He looked like a veteran fighter, and this is really the first time for a guy who's always showed you so much potential, but now nearing 30, you heard him in that post-fight interview saying, I'm not a regular UFC fighter. Do not treat me like one. I believe I'm elite. I want to face the elite and prove that. Jordan was fresh off a very good-looking knockout over Duhu Choi. This is another strong victory. And anytime you talk to the coach of Touchy Feely, the Hall of Famer Uriah Faber, he'll tell you this is a future champion as long as he can continue this maturation process and get there. Hey, he looked great tonight, Eric. How do we not root for a guy whose nickname is Touchy Feely? I mean, that's funny. That's funny. It was like when Shaquille O'Neal nicknamed his pool area Shaquapulco. That's funny. I mean, that, you know, that, everybody has to acknowledge that that's funny. All right. Um, sometimes you have to acknowledge that you see something you weren't expecting. Any future stars that you saw tonight? Anybody step up and you go, okay, they maybe announce their presence with authority. Yeah, I mentioned this is a big night for the women's featherweight division where it's basically champ Shevchenko and everyone else. Calvillo looked great. She's instantly a contender. But remember this name, Maria Ag Agapova. I'm sorry, I'm, I mispronounced that badly at the moment there. Uh, this is a fighter from Kazakhstan who lost when she tried the Dana White Contender Series. Had to go back to another organization, was lingering, but at 23, finally got a chance for her USC debut. And Maria Agapova came out and looked like a young, you want a young Jacek, looked like a future star, not just in her striking ability, the volume, the ability to get that finish there, as I butchered her name, apologies, but the swagger, EK, Sometimes you can see just a little taste, right? First time we saw Conor McGregor back in the day. Something special coming off of him. Let me remind you at Women's Flyway, it is a short path to the top with a great transcendent champion in Shevchenko. Be on the lookout for this Kazakh fighter. She looks to be the goods. BC getting it done. Excellent work, Brian. Let's do it again soon. Do you want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game? The highlights, the picks, the instant analysis, no yelling, no fake debates, no politics. Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.